and feel free to read favorite poems of theirs by other authors or ones they themselves have written. And you can read it off your phone, whatever you like. We've got books of poetry in the stacks that are likely to have the poems that you like that we can retrieve for you. Um, and we've got refreshments back there. Um, does anyone have any questions before we begin? All right. Reader is Richa Davy, and she's reading a poem called Take Heart. The scrub jay stares at me in disbelief. The condescension in his beady eyes radiate. The suet is frozen solid, you know. I sip my chai from a steaming cup in a heated room. I appreciate his predicament. He clings to frozen mesh meant to discourage the young grackles and shoots his arrow-like beak to pluck the precious seeds of life from a frozen block of fat. It is so cold this morning that no one yet sings. Already the woodpecker is pounding out some primordial beat in the treetops above the drive. The pileated favor our forest, whom scarcely seen are omnipresent, in a rhythm of satiation like heartbeats, one generation to the next. Hark the faint song, a red flash in the barren bush, announces the lifeblood has roused himself again, the cardinal of hope, I call him that, each morning. For in the bleak despair of winter, he, the color of my sleeping tulips, lingers and sings. Shake off the winter in your bones, place upon you the mantle of spring, take heart. Oh. is Felix Gariano reading <coughs> the poetry of my father. Some of you may know the speaker. <laughs> the poetry of my father. My father's taste in poetry was diverse and eclectic. <laughs> my father's taste in poetry was diverse and eclectic. A professor of English would doubtless be appalled. He seemed to love each poem in his repertoire equally, the maudlin, the silly, the wacky, the sublime. He saved them in his brain like a quiver of arrows, ever at the ready for launching into the heavens. Rhyming nonsense verse especially enthralled him those magic sounds in turn charmed me and my sisters and me. We heard Kilmer's trees so often we learned it by heart. He proclaimed stanzas of Thayer's Casey at the Bat. He knew most of Bryant's Thanatopsis too. He recited Holmes's The Last Leaf as if it were a prayer. Soon we kids could say Frost's Snowy Evening with him. Scott's The Lay of the Last Minstrel was another favorite. He intoned it with the fierce passion of a brimstone sermon. We knew Kipling's Gunga Din was a better man than I am. He declaimed his poems with such gusto that we regarded him in awe as a force of nature. He spewed poems spontaneously like a Yellowstone geyser like a frolicking white whale spouting poetry into the air. He was a poetry lover, a reciter, not a poetry writer. Many knew more about verse than my father, but no one enjoyed or loved it more than he. The poems of my dead father are alive today in me. Amen. Robin Schaefer is going to read Space. Hi, everybody. <coughs> Thank you for coming. Um, 
Space. I hesitate to wake and find the dawn a murky contour, a crowd of gentle shapes left in the wrong places, an upended jumble of fascination. Our grandchildren found a trunk of treasures from my mother's hope chest. Today, I am grateful for the burned out light bulb in my closet. I won't see the piles of high-heeled shoes I can't walk in. I start down the stairs to tidy up trappings, a medley of things and clutter. If I began counting, I would amass the endless this and that, little books, old and dusty, with broken down spines and rusty pieces of old time games. I could guess the handwritings, which ones tallied the losers and winners. I have more vases than the garden has flowers. I feel crowded by years of papers and pictures. I've lost my desire for useless things, and yet I hold tight to memories. I know I'm the keeper of the family history. It lives inside my burgeoning cupboards. But just for today, I'd like to send it away. Let go of the weight. Instantly, I would be free, surrounded by light and air. I'd dance in the dark in my empty house, the windows and doors standing open and moonlight would be streaming across the empty floors and walls of the beautiful all of nothing. <laughs> uh, next, uh, Patricia Ercolino will read two poems, What If It Is True and, a, and Human Bodies. Not in that order, I read it backwards because of the way you Thank you. Starting with human bodies, happenstance or incredible. Now there is there is a site and it is a real site. You can go to it, you can verify all the facts that are in this poem, and it's kind of fun. I mean some of the facts that I learned were amazing. Human bodies, happenstance or incredible. People might not know the following facts about humans, but these items are ever so true. ScienceDaily.com informs us there are many fascinating pieces of information to accrue. Let's start with something very familiar and small. How sensitive are human digits? Our fingers. Fingers, the size of the earth could distinguish between a house and a car. How about widgets? Sensitivity of humans continues. If the earth were flat and it was completely dark, people's eyes could observe a flickering candle from 20 miles away. That's quite a perk. How about doing a workout equal to the one, the focus, the one the focusing muscles of you, in your eyes do daily. Eyes move approximately 100,000 times a day. You have to walk 50 miles to match this. Can't be lazy. Perhaps you would like to travel the distance composed of the average person's blood vessels. Be prepared for a journey 60,000 miles or circle the earth two and a half times. Ready to wrestle? After all that exercise, <coughs> do you think you would be in the mood for a hot cup of tea, coffee, or cocoa? Wait 30 minutes. That's how long it takes a human body to produce the heat to boil a gallon of water. You may know a Formula One race car obtained a speed of 209 miles per hour on a good day. Our bodies beat that hands down Nerve impulses travel at the speeds of 250 miles per hour every day. Blushing may happen outside on a person's face, but inside our stomachs 
sympathize in their space, love. The human brain releases neurotransmitters and hormones equal to amphetamines. Heart rates increase, appetites and sleep are lost, there's intense excitement, that's no hill of beans. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. The stars in our galaxy number 300 trillion. Yeah, 300 billion. Compare that to the atoms in an adult human. Seven octillion. In a day, every day, the blood in a person's body travels 12,000 miles. We have to go from sea to shining sea four times to obtain that profile. Sticks and stones, or granite. What are human bones capable of doing? A matchbox size of a person's bone can support nine tons. Please, no booing. How much sense do we have? Five traditional senses, sound, sight, touch, smell, taste, and 15 others senses, including balance, temperature, pain, and time. Additionally, internal senses for suffocation, thirst, and fullness. Happistance or incredible. I think incredible. <laughs>
We cannot argue this is true from the same pallet, also true. A rancid stink of deprivation spreading like contagious lava, burning bridges brutalizing the senses and overwhelming love. How long can both truths endure? It's a long stretch between the two. Or is there a total disconnect? Every now and then, at least it used to be in our poetry group, <clears throat> Patricia would give us uh, <laughs> uh, something to write about and um, if you don't bring a poem you're a little bit ostracized <laughs> Tuesday morning angst <clears throat> Patricia gave us lots of time to gather our thoughts into rhyme just what excuse have I got since my seedlings flourished not? Oh yes, my sinusite is drained, and outside I see it has rained. I didn't say that I'll be there. I'm not sure, although I do care and love to sip and tape and listen, as lilting words escape their prison and crystallize before our eyes and our group's bi-weekly enterprise. <laughs> <clears throat> Grass. Grass has earthworms in her hair. Under the sod, I've seen them there. Salt kills grass and so does pee. I eat salt and it doesn't kill me. How can grass live after losing its head? If I lost mine, wouldn't I be dead? Maybe the mower cuts off her feet while her head is buried down in the peat. So that's why Lawn doesn't move away. We cut off her feet so she has to. <laughs> I don't know if there's a frog hollow in southeast Ohio. You'll but, have to speak up. Okay. But there, this frog hollow that I'm writing about is in, on Vashon Island in Puget Sound, just west of Seattle, where my son and his family live. And one day we had an outing that was fun. So, off path in Frog Hollow. Letting ourselves get thoroughly lost on purpose is delicious in that way, where time is no factor and there is no particular goal. Only a hope and an enjoyment in sharing the foraging hunt. We play so squirrel-like in the woods, one eye out for the reason we're there. Maybe a color that's a little brighter, but half hidden not to mention, be mistaken for a light-colored leaf, that disappointing decoy. Then on inspection, we, ha-ha, and pluck a sensuously curved, if dirt-covered, white chanterelle, duly noting the firmly ridged underbelly on its hymenium to confirm authenticity and not some sly imposter Every 20 feet produces often a trio of delights near impossible to see. They hide for good reason, so we go deeper in lost, not unlike love, with its unevenly spaced rewards. Unaware, but in hot pursuit, we plunge in. The thicket gets tighter. We forget where we were to start. Let's go this way. No, this way. Look, there's another one and another. And in that pause, there's always a pause, we notice the light. It's darker and we are loster. 
with a bag full of mushrooms, still carefully stepping over logs, trying to follow the light without panic, takes us into thornier thickets and impossibly more mushrooms. So many mushrooms, we feel piggish. That's enough. We have to get out until we see the next one and the next, because there's usually a group. And it's the thrill of this madness, the dark be damned, the foam battery dead. We are not playing. We are crazed, consumed. The chanterelles call us, and we come. <laughs> Because we are poets and not efficiency experts, Chris Cooper is going to read next, but we, somewhere along the line, her poems didn't get to Todd, so he could make a copy of it. So you're just going to have to listen good, closely. Period, okay. That's the last one I could read. Chipmunk. Small, sinewy, striped, striped, not striped, not striped. This is poetry after all. Slightly fluffy tail, not as aerodynamically evolved or involved, and primarily terrestrial, not arboreal. Leaping from branch to branch, like my cousin the squirrels. Large beady eyes, small rounded ears, a dynamically formed and brain beastie. The tendency to dash, swerve, dance in the road mar margins. Cheating the scavenger who prey upon my slower road companions. Who fall, to the, uh, fall to the unwary, who don't look both ways before following the chicken. Why the chicken fall across the road? It was following me, but it was too slow. Hence my flourishing dynamism. If I saw amongst the leaving leave forest litter, or rummaging for bugs and botanicals, forever rustling, seeking, handling the thoughts of the green sea, a too organic muncher, a tidier, not a disruptor. Few cars swerve for me. My size allows Houdini-esque escapes. My acclaim supersedes political and economic correctness. For many ways, I'm too small to squish. <laughs> <laughs> Dragonfly. Enameled, buzzing, filigreed wings. Insect come fabled imaginary beast. Flying in synchronized formation through hazy summer heat. Coruscating in, through, and behind the sun. The beating of your wings, seeing, seeing a pain to the end of summer sensation. You rise from your wetland birth and infancy, your aquatic youth being voracious to feed your metamorphosis, tearing with rapacious serrated teeth into your soft body prey. The xeric sun drying your unfolding body with its biplane wings, glittering with hoarded treasure in the sun. You feed only on the wing. Snatching mosquitoes, flies, and undesirables were beautiful than bats, but not as cute as, as, as faces as they. You are ancient, upper carboniferous, 300 million years ago. You were huge, 24 plus inch wingspan. Now you are small, it's oxygen to enhance size. But you still amaze, gladden, foster dreams of fire breathing dragons in the landscape. I'm going to read a poem called Twillaby Pond. Okay. The merms and the murties and the little wee pox live in the garden, in the pond, in the rocks, and scarce can be seen though you look hard and long, but by listening close you might hear their song. It chimes like the bells of the wild columbine. It's the gossamer sound of the moonflower vine. Their voices float on the breeze from the ferns down there below where the garden path turns, where the merms and the murties and the little wee pox live in the garden, in the pond, in the rocks. A little wee pock and a water blue pret sat by the pond with their toes in the wet. The pret said, oh pocky, don't be such a stick. We'll do it, twill be a fantabulous trick. We'll get a great leaf from the pandy moor tree with quite enough room for you and for me. We'll both climb aboard and push out from the shore and follow the wind where we've not been before. The little wee pock, with a humongous sigh, said, all right, I guess, let's give it a try. Away the leaf went on the wind's pushy breath, and the little wee pock was scared half to death. 
Then the whole world opened out there on the pond, and the friends saw marvels stretching beyond all they'd experienced and accepted before of life when they'd only been stuck on the shore. The two got caught in the fun of it all and didn't feel quite so tiny and small. A half dozen murties were drying their socks by the edge of the pond on a pile of rocks. One noticed the sky and suddenly croaked, Those croaks on that leaf are sure to get soaked. Yikes, so will our socks if we don't fetch them in. Look lively, lads, toss them all in this bin. Then all at once the rain fell down, and the pock and the pret were sure they would drown, but it was only a sprinkle of brief summer rain. While it was still raining, the sun shone again, and a glim glorious rainbow in the blink of an eye arched down to the pond from the midst of the sky. The rainbow came down in their path straight ahead, and then they were inside the square sounding red. Orange sounded like circles as round as its name. Yellow just crinkled, could not stay the same. Green sounded shiny like fiddlehead ferns, and blue sounded wild like the calling of terns. Deep sounding indigo sound seemed grown up and strong, but violet was lovely, a meadow sweet song. Then they were back in the regular world, though their brains and their eyeballs quivered and swirled. But the wind kept on blowing, so the leaf traveled fast, and the opposite shore showed up at last. The pox said, oh, Pret, for both of our sakes, I hope you know how to put on the brakes. <laughs> Merms were cavorting and larking abouting, pipping and ticking and laughing and shouting. When along blew a leaf with two riders aboard, the merms caught their breath, then with one accord, they shouted, oh, look, see those two on that leaf? They'd better stop or they'll both come to grief. Then the riff, leaf pirouetted, spun completely around, skipped up on the bank, dumped the two on the ground. Quite out of breath, they lay where they fell, till one of them, nudging the other, said, well, we've sailed a great distance. We've traveled this far. We'd better get up and see where we are. The Pret and the Pock explored where they beached to learn what sort of place they had reached. There were interesting creatures they'd not met before. Rissies and quadots, a striped prickly chore, great mottled dibdabs and squirgs by the sack, and some great yellow belobes, which are actually black. A, a splash-colored puddle jumper, mud to the knees, was making the telltallies hiccup and sneeze. It was wondrous, exciting, but quite wore them out, and that's when they began looking about for a way to get home, which seems farther away than it appeared to them back at the start of the day. The Pret whispered softly, when we started to roam, we just didn't think about how to get home. We've got ourselves into a shivery plight if we have to stay here for all of the night. The little wee pox felt smaller than small, and the water blue Pret had no color at all. Lonely, unhappy, they tried not to cry, but could not help but to blink hard and sigh. With a singing of wings and a warm humming light, banishing the darkness and coming of night, a fire moth landed beside them. It said, I'm sure you would like to get home in your, like to be home in your bed if you climb on my back and take a tight grip so you don't fall off in the midst of the trip. I'll take you back to the pond's other side. Now hold with both hands so you don't slip and slide. The fire moth launched itself from the ground and flew with that curious bell-seeming sound. When the pret and the pot looked all about, they wanted to whistle, they wanted to shout because seldom seen by the world beyond, below was their own, their Twillaby Pond. <laughs> so, that's... that's it. <laughs> Do my duty here. Um, we now have the time for an open mic, though we don't have a mic, but, um, so you have to speak up. And it's Allegra Damiano, I wasn't sure what, anyway. She is going to be our first open mic reader, and she'll tell you what she's going to read, and then, I mean, she's not going to read it, she's going to recite it. Shall I introduce it for you? Yeah. This is a, a poem by Robert Frost that I'm sure you all know. It's called Stopping in Woods on a Snowy Evening, and uh, Allegra memorized it. So, yeah. Allegra, your turn. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it's queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. 
He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sound the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep. And miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Anybody else have something they want to read? Oh, this one. Come up and, uh, yeah, come ahead. And then um, introduce yourself, explain, give the name of your My poem. My name's Sarah Heine. Um Thank you for doing this today. This is my first time ever reading my poems. Um, I have two here. So the first one's called Relativity. My daughter cannot play the piano the way that your daughter plays one. At seven years old, her taste in clothes aren't about to win her any fashion braves. Her performance on the soccer field? I'll let you know as soon as she kicks the thing. <laughs> and if training wheels are any tell, don't bet on my daughter to be first on Mars. Truth be told, I'm not convinced that she could explain to you what gravity is. The figures she paints often hang about in space, the heart on dad's chest as big as his face. And yet, I hope you will not draw from this that she's a star's breath less than luminous. For when she smiles, the world grows lighter. And when my daughter's laughing, I know why we're here. You need to speak up just a Okay, yeah. sure. And this one's called When to Wear. <clears throat> when I die, let it happen outside in the arms of a faithless spring. Let the light go out near water and trees. Let someone say after her eyes were open. Let the driftwood drift. Let the fish go blurp. Let the vulture circle its infinite earth. Let my breath be swept by the next stiff breeze. Let a million leaves all shuffle the deck. Let the sky stay blue as my face falls slack. Let the sun roll off the tip of my tongue. Where over the chasm and without a pause, the insects will strum some summer hymn, and the birds will raise their voice to a head, crowning, yes, yes, the song plays on. And remember, you need to speak up because we don't have a microphone. <clears throat> Um, my name is Bolo, and I've been writing for quite a while now, and this is how you doing. When the phone rings, or you get a message that you need at the hospital, and you'll get the answers once you arrive, only it's about a cancer, your loved one won't survive, how you doing? When your best friend makes it clear that the prescriptions aren't working, they push you away, there's an indication that they don't want you near. Then a week later, wrists have been split, the pills were swallowed, and you were informed they walked that narrow tightrope known as suicide. How you doing? When you wake up with no energy or sense of self, and all it takes is a few bitter pills that seem to help, you know this won't last forever as you fall into the black hole known as a coma, so far, so deep, that no one hears your cries or yelps. How you doing? When someone you are connected to spends their whole life not in yours, and one day you write a letter to help open the store, and with their response comes the realization that they can't even spell your name correctly, how you doing? When the world you know is filled with turmoil and fray, and you plaster on a fake smile just to get through every single day, how you doing? When you turn 16, and all you wanted was a shiny car, a sparkling diamond ring, but then you're Parents sit you down, give you a revelation of truth that at a young age you were adopted. How you doing? When you realize that the whole life you built with your soulmate, your partner, is on a foundation of lies and the HIV test comes back with a positive sign. How you doing? As the sun sets and brings with it the night sky, you look up, you ask God, Buddha, Muhammad, Yahweh, or simply the universe, this life, why? And the rustling through the, or the, then the silence, then the simple wind, and the rustle through the trees. This is your only reply? How you doing? When you hear this phrase and your 
mind, your body, your soul feels in such a way that the moments you've encountered won't ever seem to fade. Then you start counting the hundreds of letdowns, the thousands of times of nastiness that has led to that upside down smile known as a frown, and you can't possibly take it anymore. So you fall to pieces upon the floor. It's kind of been this way since age four. How you doing? When a loved one is in rehab, but the strength of their addition pushes them to inject, snort, or smoke that drug they shouldn't have, they fall upon your mind and they leave their sanctuary. How you doing? When you wake up and struggle with a son or daughter's mind or body are in disarray, it could be that disease known as cerebral palsy, and your determination to care for your child is so strong that you don't have the strength to give up, and you strain yourself along the way. How you doing? When each day seems like the rest, your life is a uh, solo game of chess. It could be because your children have left your nest, and all you ever wanted was someone who, whom was sent from above to come to you, to heal your heart, to give it true love. How you doing? As you realize, there is never a good answer to life's simple questions. So all you can be is a beggar that waits. For patience is your virtue, as the weight I speak of never comes in or around with a crashing sound, but pulls, pushes, and brings with it the good, bad, and ugly. I can only hope it doesn't hold you back or down. For if you value the joys in life, no one will ever need to ask about this journey or destiny. So don't fear the question. How you doing? Thank you. I really don't want the attention to be on me when it should be on me instead. We're the poems I are and not the man in the chair. That is why we sit or I am at the podium. Only three poems will I read to you, so worry I will not. At the Emperor's hand, the Jedi met defeat. But nowhere on Richland Avenue is there for me to retreat. For murky swamps and hollow trees play second fiddle. When compared, they are to a red roof building with a salad bar in the middle. <laughs> but to Dagobah I will go with a piece of my heart greatly cut. A Saturday it will not be than when they abandoned Pizza Hut. <laughs> no, not many Pizza Hut fans. <laughs> Ooh, greasy, yes, yes. Zero waste in my swampy home. I do try to live. Compost all my scraps back to the planet I give. A garden I have with the ingredients for my stews. When 900 year old intestine you've got, some food will not do. In the realm of gardening, truthfully, I am quite dumb. Yet large my vegetables grow. For very green are my thumbs. <laughs> One more, yes, yes, time you have. Mm -hmm. Revolting, I find it, all the garbage in space. Dump its trash, the Empire does, without a tear on its face. Drift, it will, within that endless abyss. A monument it is to man's greed and selfishness. The younger generation, I can only hope, will find that trash is never treasure in Mother Nature's mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, yes, yes, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sorry, I put up with that. Look, I see Patricia in there. Hi, hi, hi. I see my folder stuff. Oh, it's okay. Hi, Nan. Oh, hi. my goodness. There's that camera again. Um, I don't know what to read. Um, I'll read, um, I'll read this one. Um, oh, geez. Okay, it's short. Um, it's called saudade or saudage it's in um, Portuguese for like missing on days when rain chooses not to wane when clouds fall heavy and extract pain when the Sun takes all you have gained you remember days when those drops dampen not but bathe you remember days when those clouds cover not but save you remember I lost it, where am I? <laughs> when that sun burns not, but aids in keeping close, so memories fade not, but stay with you always. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't catch it. Connor was the one that wrote what he was reading. He was not reading from the book. Okay. So yay, Connor. Good job. <laughs> Looked like he was reading from the book, didn't it? No. <laughs> well, it did to me. <laughs> Glad you realized that. And I am here representing somebody else. I am not reading something I wrote. This was written by Brad Jagman. It's a poem about his father. And I want to give a tribute to Larry Jagman, his father. Last time that we had a poetry reading, Right, I don't remember how long before our poetry reading, one of our other poets had passed away, and Larry recently did pass away. And so I want to give a tribute to him. There are no tables or anything, because for Larry, that Joy was a painter. Joy was an artiste and had many, many wonderful, she was so talented. Um, Larry's talents were different. He was the people person. And I tried. I called several people and I said, please, I want to put together something as a tribute to Larry to honor his memory and all that he did. Athens County has no idea how indebted they are to Larry. I'm going to read a list before I read the poem that Brad wrote. Uh, these are some of the things that I was able to get, to get from several people. Three things kept on coming up. One, he was extremely active in his church, Central Avenue Methodist Church. He had been a board member. He had been the chair of the board. He did all kinds of activities with the church and through the church, including going in. He was the one that initiated so many of these things. He initiated a mission trip over into Honduras to an orphanage there to help the kids and to help build what was needed there and to help do repairs. He also was the one that started a Thanksgiving. Isn't that appropriate? We're getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving. And he was the one that, through Central Avenue Methodist Church, started a Thanksgiving dinner, a community Thanksgiving dinner for free. Um, he also did, a, he was a, a board member, chair of the staff parish relations committee. And, oh, and by, by the way, when he did the Thanksgiving dinner, he didn't just organize getting everybody's food so that way the community would have food available. I was told he also went door to door knocking on the community members' houses and, put, and invited them, you are, you are welcome to come to this dinner that we are going to have. That's the kind of man Larry was. He was behind the scenes, but when needed, he was out there doing what needed to be done to get things done. He was also a board member of Havar, square dancing. He and his wife were avid square dancers. He was part of the Athens Community Singers that was headed by Stephanie Morris. That was a special needs group that got together, and both Larry and his wife participated in that. Um, he also, as we know, was part of the poetry group. And that's where some people first met him. Most, most things that Larry did centered on special needs. He was the one that got Challenge by Choice started. He was a member, he was a member of the Athens City <coughs> Commission on Disabilities. He did a lot of activities with them, got things going. He was a longtime member of Central Avenue Church. Also good works. He was a volunteer there. He, um, Havar, he was, a, he was one of their board members, again, very active. He also, for those that are connected with the university, he was one that got some things going for the retired OU faculty gathering. At his funeral, it was known, it was asked, the question was asked, how many people in that room, and the room was packed, I was at Central Avenue United Methodist Church, and they were asked, how many of you received a poem from Larry with 
there were very few hands that were not raised. So he had written, in just being represented by that room, over a hundred some poems for people. They also, and this I think is amazing. Uh, oh, limit. Let me save that one. I forgot. I forgot to mention. Did I mention Boy Scouts? He was actively involved in Boy Scouts and making sure that it kept on going. Um, FINA. That stands for Far East Side Neighborhood Association. That is something else Larry was the one that initiated. So he did things far, overseas, and close in his own neighborhood. I have gained a great deal of respect for Larry. And I want to encourage, if any of you know Larry and some things that are not on this list, I would like to know because I want to do something formally for him. At the funeral, it was revealed that Larry had been giving to 92, 92 charities. I don't know how much he gave. That doesn't make any difference. But that shows the heart of one Larry Jagman. This poem that was written by, and I'm giving this to his wife after this, um, but this is the poem that Larry's son Brad wrote. It's an acrostic. He started out with, Larry was a poet, and boy, did everybody know it. Loved all, and his favorite sport, sport was basketball. Always caring for others, especially his honey, and he enjoyed sharing his time, home, and money. Relied on by many, and was willing to give away his very last penny. Reminiscing about Larry Jagman reminds us that he truly was a great man. Yearned to please the Lord, which meant he was never bored. Joined and led many groups in order to keep people from just going through hoops. An average man he was not. He was always willing to do a lot. God's angel since birth has finally ascended from earth. Educating wasn't just his career. He was always teaching me to put down my beer. Mentored those near and far, even giving some a car. Able to be a great family man and yet still make time for God's plan. Never forgetting that heaven is the end game, while knowing the only way to get there is through Jesus' name. And to my mom, you helped bring our dad out of his shell, which allowed him to blossom into the talkative, loving, and hugging person that he was. That kind of gives you a good description of who Larry Jagman was. They say there's nothing new under the sun, and my poem is a good example of this. It's a collage, actually, that I've put together of uh, uh, lines of poetry from some of the greatest poems ever written by John Keats, by Ernest Dodson, by, uh, from the Rudy of, uh, Ruby out of Omar Khayyam. But I've, about 90% of the poem is, is mine. But the last line of each stanza I've stolen from one of these great poets, <laughs> so, including the title of my poem, which is called Wine is Bottled Poetry. Wine is Bottled Poetry. It's a line from Robert Louis Stevenson, of all <coughs> people. Some say the greatest <coughs> gift from the gods was wine, divinely drunk by some as Christ's blood divine. I too like to lift a glass and let my senses swim with beaded bubbles winking at the brim. Clearly, wine, love, and poetry are all close kin. In these we see life's brevity with less chagrin. Carpe diem, 
our poetry aptly juxtaposes. They are not long the days of wine and roses. Let us waste our <coughs> sweet time with regret. Life's too honeyed to grouse and fret. A book of verses beneath the bough, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou. How luscious they were, how fast they flew. Any one would have been enough, die he knew. So let's select a poem and a wine that's fine and enjoy them together for they entwine. <laughs> Okay, now I have three very short poems. I'll read the dark one first. <laughs> Thread of thee. My lips are dry. Steady rain makes marshy places among the stones. Wind harries trees stark against a storm-bruised sky. A chill I cannot lose slides dark along my bones. You are gone from here. I have no hope of your return. Julie, child of her mother's heart, Julie plays in tepid pools of winter sunshine trickling through curtained windows. Solemnly blue-eyed is Julie, wispy-haired, an elfin sort, child of her mother's heart. Now this last one is an acrostic, which Patricia mentioned. An acrostic is a poem written so that the first letters of the lines coming down the left-hand side spell the topic of the poem. Breeze born. Lightly lilting through the air, as bright as bits of diamond or of gold, unfazed by heavy thoughts or care, gaily singing through summer air, happy children's laughter everywhere takes away the burdens of the old, ever lilting through the summer air, remaining bright as diamonds or as gold. Three people that have already shared something have other poems to read. Yeah, well, they're, they, they, they put up their hands. Yeah, yeah, come on. Come, come on up, Chris. Chris. You're not. <laughs> this one's um, about a boy, a young man named Sam Waters, who I never knew, but he disappeared. Um, March of 2014, and his body was later, later recovered in the Hawking River. Um, and he just, he really stuck with me. So this one's called Boy. They pulled you out between White's Mill and Courier Street, about a mile from the bridge where you parked. The river is warmer than it was in March, when everyone was looking and putting up signs, and later on, looking less. Checking on Facebook to report what your mom said, connecting the dots to fashion the lead. You were missing Athens, man. Knives in the wood after a knife-throwing act. A stain of old pain in the rear of your reflection. How come we hadn't learned our lesson? You left your keys in the ignition. There was goodness there in the swell. Everyone shouldering hope and doubt on competing scales. It seemed the proof you were looking for. If life has worth, people will fight for it. If people fight, living is worth it. It made sense on its face. You had a great smile. I could see your mother's hope in it. You wore your hair long and it made you look vulnerable. You probably would have hated this, but sweet is the word that springs to mind. This world is hard on gentle boys. And I keep trying to recall if the pizza delivery guy had long hair or short. The week before Christmas, we got pizza at work. Why should I want to put you there? What could it possibly matter? Your mother said she'd come for you, just hang tighter. Once the weather turned, I ran the section of the bike path that bends to the river, forward and back and forward again, pacing myself to its muted rhythms, its crooked spine and frequent joggers. The birds were sharp, soft, both together all at once. The wind and the grass was a woman's dress, a mouthful of milk on a taut clothesline. My son plays baseball in the fields nearby. But you were a rustle in the thirsty brush, drawing my thoughts as my feet held the line, because I saw the men huddled across the bank, sonar trawling, sirens off, the water flashing its teeth in the sun. 
There and back I took the bridge, calling the edges with my eyes, reading the gaps between the lines, seeing the eddies bubble and froth, disturbed by the dead limbs, big rocks, uprooted trunks, trespassing on something that wasn't mine, even now not sure what I'm doing here. But you see how absence becomes abyss, and you think, God, how do they carry this? I absorbed you, not impulsively, not all at once, but incrementally with the herd. We swallowed you in desperate sips. You sank in like tea, leaving leaves at the end. An archetype with a shape pulled from the caves. The lost son, come back. Your brother has killed the fattened calf. For you, come back, won't you hear? And now, I want to take your picture down so that she won't have to. I want to hug my children tighter, preserving their shape in a better tomorrow. We never learn. It never makes sense. You needed more time. Pain is a bridge. The paper said you left a poem behind. It's April now. Winter was hard. The lilac is late this year. Found my earth again, through the leaf litter, then the, lo then the loneliness of living soil, past the gooey adhesiveness of anoxic <clears throat> clay, into the grit of dying rock forming in its solvent of water, the sands and seashores yet to be, worming my way between grains of granite, limestone, and sandstone. I must go down into my earth again, breaking into the stone vaulted ceilings of eternally nighted caves. The unheard whisper of wind from crevices located eons away. No light, only the air breathing upon the streams wandering through me. Gravity's labyrinthine, Minoan path to a streamless origin. And escaping the light and biotic superfluity of the earth's uppermost crust. I must go down to my earth again, where I wander through the darkness with the everlasting groan of geodesic plates grinding eternally upon each other, echoing through me driven by the vortices of heat from nucleic fission in the Earth's core, doing a global samba, proofreading the history of the planet. Yes, I must go down to my Earth again, and my Earth and antecedents again, where the order of the universe is a pleasantly <coughs> damp, organic, minerally smell. Like, like Proust and Madeleine, it takes me back to the eschatology of the universe. And then, mortality. Much of our life, literature, philosophy, psychology, and science at all is spent in a search for our grand etiology of existence. We plumb the depths of religion, the superstructure of history, the origin of life, the depths of the universe, all in a vain search for the utmost meaning. We spend our days in animalistic consumption, fornication, defecation, micturation, with little or no thought for anything but the immediate moment. Even our religious beliefs are fragile, are fraught with self-aggrandizement. We must be greater than the rest of creation, formed by divine mind and hand, be better than the fruit fly. Who has a fruit fly, the exact moment of fruit fly them, is the best fruit fly that it can be. Can we say the same of ourselves? Can we even apply, try to apply the golden rule to our actions, thoughts, expectations, hopes, destinations? Maybe a fruit fly is someone we should ache to be. And mortality too. Now that our fruit fly, now that our fruit fly, now that our fruit fly and potential has been attained, there's still some hurdles to be jumped. A lifespan of nearly 30 days, and is that much linear time to attain an acme of eternal international renown, fly or not. Two weeks of fruit fly daycare, with a couple of days of her sexual maturation, not much time for innate nurture and experiential choices to wreck any character modifying permutations, for our stalwart, stalwart hero heroine to rise above. Picture of Dorian fruit fly, Elmer Gant fly, the red fruit fly, great grapes of fruit fly, on the petri dish, on the agar, agar front. Not much literary license to overcome or even bask in. Even our best fruit fly can't overcome its epigenetic limitations. Maybe even our, even our humans, most common sins are to bread the bone to be excised. Perhaps our strivings for divine asymptotic approachment is equally impossible. 
But then now what do we do? And I am finished. Thank you. <laughs>